Good morning, Severn Run. How are y'all doing today? And welcome to our online crew. We are super excited that you're here. Drop a hello in the comments. Um, let us know where you're watching from, and we hope to see you in the building soon, but we're glad you're here online. Um, so for those of you who are here, welcome. And my name is Emily. I'm the communications coordinator here at Severn Run, and I'm really excited to be here in worship with you this morning. So um, first off, just like last week, we have Connect cards, so we would love for you to fill these out. Let us know that you're here. Let us know if you'd like to get involved in serving or if there's a specific way we can be praying for you. We would love to know how we can do that for you. You can either drop it in one of the giving baskets as it comes by during the offering time. You can drop it off at the welcome desk. We also have our new Next Steps space outside, in the, not outside, but in the atrium. Um, so you can stop by and talk to somebody there um, and kind of see how you can get involved. And just remember, last week I shared with you a little bit about baptism. That's always an option here at Severn Run, and we would love to see it happen for you all. So um, if that's something you want to talk to somebody about, stop by uh, the Next Steps kiosk or the welcome desk, and we'd love to talk to you. Um, so with that, we're going to jump into worship. Uh, once again, my husband, Matt Gardner, is going to be preaching this morning. So um, biased again, but excited. So um, we're glad you're here. So let's show, go ahead and jump into worship. Hi, you guys. If you're able, please stay with us. This is Living in the Open.
And this next song is so beautiful because it just reminds us of who our creator is. And that, yes, he's this big, awesome God, but he, he made us for a reason and he wants to be with us. And I just think that's so beautiful. Hello, maker of the moon. Your creation has inspired my every move. You're the science in the stars. There is beauty, there is fire in your eyes. Face to face, lost in wonder of the God of time and space. The universe declares your praise, singing holy, holy is your name. Yeah. 
Amen. Please be seated. Friends, as we get to continue to worship and the truth of those words, the goodness of God, the praise of his glory and creation throughout the universe, we get to move into a time now of giving. We get to move into a time to celebrate who God is and what he's done, to uh, be a part of his mission, to be a part of his love and service through the ministry that he has called us here together as the church at Severn Run. This is a time that we give cheerfully, and it's not a time of compulsion or or arm twisting. It is your response to God in this time to give. And for those of you at home, there's uh, information about how to give online. There's some information on the screens about giving in person. We will have people come in just a moment and pass some offering baskets. But if you're new with us or returning for the first time in a while, really the gift we would love from you today is your uh, Connect card. So on your chair, uh, either um, right under you, you might be sitting on it or in a chair next to you, you can grab a blue card, fill that out, let us know who you are and how we could best connect to you and your family, connect to you and uh, encourage you on your next step of joining a church, of getting involved, finding a place to serve. We would cherish that opportunity and gift from you today. And if you haven't already, uh, you can visit our uh, our welcome area outside and have a gift we'd love to share with you today as well. So we're going to pray for our time of giving. We're going to pray for the new friends and family that are joining our church community and anticipate what God is going to do as we love and serve together. So if you would, let's pray, and then we'll pass our offering baskets in just a moment. God, thank you for your goodness and grace. God, thank you for the ability, uh, God, that you've created us in a way that we are able to build new tools that look deep into the universe to see farther than we've ever seen before. God, and in that, in that glory, in that light, we find the heart of God the creativity of what you do and what you spoke into existence. God, and as we look further into the heart of every person in this room and we look further into the heart of our community, God, we see your heart and compassion for each person, your created image in each person, that every family, every community bears your image. So God, we thank you for the ministry of this church, that you've called us to be a light in the areas where you've planted us, that we can serve faithfully and lovingly and joyfully. So may this offering uh, be a grace to the ministry of Severn Run. May it be uh, a fuel to the light and message of the gospel that in kids and students and uh, in holistic mission and all of our connect groups and all the ways, God, that this ministry reaches out to support and love each other, God, that we will be serving and honoring and giving joyfully and cheerfully. And all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, talking about service, we have some really exciting things to celebrate, some exciting things to really acknowledge. Uh, We can't really continue on in the service without acknowledging. There's a few new things on stage. Uh, There's a a screen behind me that's new, and uh, this was not in the notes or anything, but I just wanted to pause and just thank all of the leaders, the people that serve, that make this environment possible. The people uh, on our production team, our new production director, Brandon, if we can give them all a big round of applause for all of their hard work and their creativity to raise uh, the creative experience, to just make things better, to make things more um, God-honoring and more excellent. So we're excited to continue to, to grow as a church and have more people join these serving teams. And if you have that itch, if you're like, I want to be on a camera, I want to be a part of uh, the tech booth and production team, if you want to learn more about that, you talk to Brandon or Clay or Sean, uh, any one of the team members can I help you take that step in the next direction. Another really great opportunity we're super excited about coming up very soon is VBS, which is August 8th. We're super excited. You guys, there are already over 100 kids signed up. We are around 50 or 60 leaders signed up, and we're still a couple of weeks away. Now, I want to say this as an encouragement, and I want to say this as a challenge, but Mark, our kids ministry director, who we're super thankful for, Paula, our kids ministry coordinator, we're super thankful for everyone that serves and leads. We have been... uh, 
um, prayerfully considering what is really the most amount of kids that we could, we could do an excellent job of EBS with. And we, we believe that 250 is going to be our cap. So we are over 100. So we're not at that level where you need to like uh, do anything drastic. But if you've just kind of been sitting back and waiting, like August 8th is a long time from now, it's coming. It's come in before you know it, and we all know that in those last days, those last moments, that uh, there could be a rush. So we encourage you, we invite you, you can go to severunrun.com slash VBS, sign up for VBS today. Invite a friend, invite a neighbor, invite a family member. It is for every child going into preschool through those who just graduated fifth grade. So that is Monday, August 8th through Thursday, August 11th. You can find out all the information online. So we make sure you know about that um, and be excited. And if you know what, if we're getting closer to 250, we'll let you know. But uh, there's no reason to wait. So sign up today for VBS. And if you want to serve, there is a link about learning how to serve uh, on the website as well. So um, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go grab my notes for the message, and we're going to play our bumper video, and we're going to come back out and move into our message time as we continue in the series of Acts. So I'll see you in a minute. All right, I realized I did not introduce myself uh, before I snuck away for a minute, but my name is Matt. I have the honor of being the student pastor and leading our Next Generation Ministries with Mark and with Paula. Uh, I love that I get to be here at Severn Run. My, my wife, Emily, and I and our kids, we moved here about two and a half years ago. Uh, so it's just been a joy to, to grow into this community, into this church, and today we get to continue our series in the book of Acts together. We get to continue learning and diving into these examples, these kind of case studies of spiritual growth, of church health, of what, of what God did many, many years ago as, as what we do today as the church at Severn Run. We get to go back to the origin story. We get to go back to the beginning, century one, the first century, to see and learn from our brothers and sisters in Christ from a different part of the world from a different time. So these passages are testimonies from the early church that get to, uh, again, illuminate and inspire and challenge us as we love and serve together, both at home, as a family, in our community, and certainly, certainly as a church. And I don't know about you, but when I'm looking to do something, to grow, to try something on, I love the benefit of watching somebody else go first, right? I love learning from somebody else's example. And don't get me wrong, I know there's plenty of times where like, I'm just gonna figure this out on my own. Uh, if I'm headed somewhere, I'm like, I, I kind of can orient myself. I might get a little lost, but I will figure it out on the way. There's plenty of times where I put the directions down and I'm just gonna put a screw right there and pray that this table stays together. That's usually why we go to Ikea because it's super easy and I can't mess it up. Some of you are shaking your head. Well, it's okay. I try my best. But when I can, when I can find an example to follow, when I can learn from someone else who has walked that path before, you know, it goes a little bit better. Uh, I mentioned last week that I had a, a, an opportunity to travel to Kenya and actually uh, went a second time and got to uh, speak with some people and learn and have some amazing experiences. And I found myself kind of out in the wilderness a little bit uh, with some men who were throwing spears. They were practicing throwing spears. And um, you know, I was 22, it was like a pretty, pretty strong, abled body. Hand me that spear. I'm gonna show you how we do this in America. I don't know. Uh, so took it and I kind of watched a couple times, you know, just a little bit of like, it's not that hard, you know, kind of picked, picked a target and I threw that thing sideways somehow. Like I threw it and it just kind of almost helicopter rotated. It was, it was embarrassing and everybody laughed. Uh, you know, they basically said, you would not be able to protect yourself if, if that's how you threw a spear. So 
In response, though, in their grace, they were able to show me some better technique. They were able to give me some coaching. I was able to watch a couple more times. And I tried again. And it was still pretty embarrassing. But the, what I kind of I got from the next response was, you know, if there was like a very sickly duck, you might, <laughs> you might succeed. Uh, still, not, still not very good, though. Uh, I know for most of my life, I'm just going to put all the cards on the table. I mean, middle school into high school and kind of into adulthood, I really relied on some combination of my father or YouTube to tie my tie. Um, some of you like, would not admit that, but I will freely admit that to you all, that I just needed to watch somebody else do it. Because if you just told me, yeah, I take this side over, under, loop-de-loop -loop and pull, or you know, it's tying your shoes. Um, if I just listened to it, it wasn't, it wasn't going to be very good. But if I could watch my dad do it, if I could pull up a quick video that I may have saved on my phone and just watched, okay, I got it. No worries. I can tie my own tie. Uh, and then honestly, you know, when I met my wife, Emily, who's from Maryland, she's a Maryland native, um, I grew up in the Chicago suburbs and then Tampa, Florida. I don't understand still how people eat crabs. But the very first time we went to her family's like crab cookout, they open up the garage door, they put tables and cover it in cloth, and then just dump these roasted red crustaceans on the table, passing out mallets and stuff. And I'm just like, I, do I gnaw on it? Like, what do you, I just, I don't know. It, like, naturally, I don't understand what you do. I don't know who figured this out the first time. It must have taken a while, but I had to kind of sit back and watch and then listen and learn and watch and frankly, be very disturbed by the whole process. But learning and watching and being a part of it together was much easier than if somebody just handed me a crab and said, go to town. Right? I literally would not, I probably would have hurt myself trying to figure that out. So it is a blessing when somebody has gone first that they can teach you, they can show you, they could tell you how to do this well. Right, they, they have an example, it's a case study, there's a precedent. I'm not on my own. I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, caught in the waves being pulled out by a current that's unfamiliar. Like I've, I've chartered this territory before because I'm, I'm walking with somebody that has gone through this before. So that's the, that's the benefit, that's the blessing we get when we go to the book of Acts. We go to century one for clarity, for an example, to learn, to grow, to not be stuck on an island all by ourselves. So these first followers of Jesus, the members of the early church, they lived drastically different lives, but we have an example in our mission of following Jesus Christ. And I want to recap with you, if we go back to God's word, back to the book of Acts, we're going to kind of recap really quick some of the lessons we have learned, some of the stories we've already encountered, and a few of the things we've already learned. Uh, really, the major theme that we've covered recently, this major theme is, is this message, that a unified church on a gospel mission cannot be defeated. Right, that's kind of been the takeaway for me every time I go back to these passages of Acts 4 and 5 and now, <clears throat> now into Acts chapter 6. A, a unified church on a gospel mission cannot be defeated. These men and women are like-minded, their hearts belong to Jesus, and they're living life on purpose, with a purpose, on a mission. So the brokenness of our world it's rising opposition against the church. It's trying to attack the mission. So in the beginning of chapter five, again, Ananias and his wife, Sapphira, tried to deceive the church by withholding money, by withholding the truth from God and from their fellow believers. This ultimately results in their death, but the mission of the church continued, right? The evidence here. The lesson learned is that a lie, an untruth, a, a deceit against the church will not corrupt its mission, right? It, it can stand uh, tall, it can stand strong against those kind of attacks from, from people that are supposed to be a part of this, that are, are going to lie and withhold the church, the truth can stand firm. Then later on in chapter five, the jealousy and hatred that was stirred up from the religious establishment, the high council of Pharisees and Sadducees, these, these temple leaders, they arrest the disciples and demand that you stop preaching this resurrection of Jesus Christ. You stop it or else. Right? They tried to use their political, the religious, and their physical power to attack and to overpower the church. But their mission of force 
failed. They thought that we could intimidate, they thought that we could conquer the church by outside pressure and intimidation, but they were wrong and their attempts failed. So as we move into chapter six, we're gonna see a new threat. This is not people lying to or about the church. This is not people putting outside pressure against the walls, against the hearts of these believers. There's a new opposition. There's a new source of potential division and it's coming from within, right? The, the call is coming from inside the house, so to speak. The unity of the church can be attacked by outside pains and prejudices, but the internal conflicts can be the most divisive and the most destructive. So a unified church on a gospel mission can't be defeated, but if that unity begins to fade, if there's cracks in the foundation, if people inside are being pulled apart, then that mission can become more difficult. This is true of the early church. It's true of Severn Run. It's true of your home, your marriage, your, your connect group. If we are pulled apart, we're not as strong. If we are pulled apart, we're not as mission able and mission focused. So let's get into this passage. Again, we're in Acts chapter one. Let's see what we can learn from the early church, from our friends in this example, because we really, guys, we really need an example of how to deal with division. Right? There's not a lot of great examples, if we're really honest. There's not a lot of really great, clear, abundant examples in our culture and uh, in our society today. There are master classes available in name calling. Um, there are you know, uh, uh, doctorate degrees in distrust and distrust and, and conspiracy, but, but what does it actually look like? What could it look like to be unified, even in the face of potential division? So let's read Acts chapter six, verse one. How will they maintain unity with potential division inside of the church? Verse one, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek speaking believers complained about the Hebrew speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. Well, that's a little different. Right? We've kind of been following the story so far in Acts chapter 4, just a few chapters earlier. It was they sold everything, and, and uh, let's see, they sold everything in verse 34. There were no needy people among them, right? So they were of one mind and one accord. They sold everything. There were no needs among them. Now to chapter 6, verse 1, there's two groups of people, and one feels discriminated against by the other. So, Here's where we're gonna do, we're gonna look at some, uh, this truth here that, that new people, new experiences, new relationships, new discoveries, they also mean that there's gonna be some new differences, some new needs, and some new strategies. You can't just keep things the way they always were. So we're gonna look at three observations from, from verse one, and then three takeaways from the next couple of verses. So, so again, three observations from verse one, starting with a growing community can never remain in the good old days because growing communities, like a growing heart, a growing mind are going to encounter new experiences, new relationships and new discoveries as they follow Jesus. As the church grows, you can't just hold on to the way we used to do it the way it used to be, the way we used to come together, because there's more people, there's new people, and that is exciting. Every, every story we've read so far has resulted in new people turning their hearts to Jesus Christ and joining the church, and that is celebrated every single time. So I hope none of us are gonna walk away thinking more people and new people is bad. It's only bad if I am attached to maintaining a status quo or a past experience, a past way of doing things, because you can't continue to grow and expect things to say exactly the same. We, we ought to really examine our hearts in this, <clears throat> excuse me, because when it comes to missional growth, we need to be careful that we're not, again, we're not just pulling back to the way we used to like it, the way it used to be. We need to lean forward and lean in. There's new people, which means there might be new 
relationships, which means we might discover a new need. And we need to constantly evaluate who is a part of our family, who's a part of our community, and what needs do they have. So if our eyes are focused forward on Jesus Christ, we're all moving, unified together in the same direction, going backwards is not an option. So the first observation here, the church is rapidly growing. That is a good thing. It's something to celebrate. There's rapid growth. And tied to that rapid growth is the reality that there's new, there's new potential for cracks and division. If they don't go addressed, they could get worse. So number two, the second observation here, the bias and brokenness that is surrounding the early church and our church today will continually attempt to creep in and cause division, right? A bias, a brokenness that exists in the community as people from that community come into the body of Christ, there is a temptation. There's a temptation for some of those bias, for some of that brokenness to enter into this community. So the early church, let's kind of like unpack this a little bit. They were surrounded by bias. They were surrounded by brokenness. So let's, let's examine their context a little bit. Over the years, right, over many, many, many years, the people of Israel were conquered by many nations. And every time that happened, there were traditionally faithfully practicing Hebrew people who were either compelled to move or forced to move away from Israel, away from Jerusalem. So that happened again and again as another country comes in, they either forcibly remove or compel people to move away from Jerusalem, away from Israel into neighboring nations. And after some time, this, this Greco-Roman culture, right, kind of covers all of those countries, all of this region to where everybody, wherever you're, you're at, you're really, you're really covered over the blanket of Greek language, of Greek culture, of a Greek mindset and way of life. So all the while, there were people who never left Jerusalem, who never, who never had to go somewhere else to learn uh, a new lifestyle or a new culture or a new language. They stayed at home in Jerusalem. They continued to speak Hebrew language or eventually Aramaic. And then you've got the people who left who now speak most likely Greek or another foreign language. So you've now got the people that, depending on what translation you're reading, there's the Greek speaking or the Hellenistic believers. And then there's the Hebrew speaking or Hebraic believers. There's the people now as the church grows, as the church now to this present moment. If you guys remember in Acts chapter two, the day of Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit comes on the, 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 the disciples and um, they're speaking in different languages. Uh, we can actually read, this is Acts chapter 2, verse 5. At that time, there were de devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard this loud noise, everybody came running and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. They were completely amazed. How can this be? These people are all from Galilee. They're, they're Hebrew speaking Jews. They shouldn't know my Greek language. In verse eight, and yet when we hear them speaking, they're speaking in our own native language. So as the church is now exploding in growth, they are now finding representation in their church of people who are traditionally Hebrew speaking. I, me and my family, we've always lived near the temple. We've always worshiped the way our ancestors worshiped. We've always spoken our ancient language. We've never changed. And then there's this other group of people, the Hellenistic, the Greek speaking Christians who are encountering the gospel. They're giving their life to Jesus Christ, but they're not from here the same way that, that the Hebrew speaking people are from here. This people in Jerusalem, there's now two growing camps. That's kind of the, the backdrop of this whole thing. In their culture, we already talked last week about the, the high court, the officials. The Pharisees were very, very biased, very, very biased towards Hebrew speaking people. They were Hebrew speaking. So in their minds, we've always lived here. We've always been a part of the temple. This is ours. They would look at the outsiders and say, you compromised when your ancestors left to go to another part of the world, you compromised. Now you wanna come back? No, I don't think so. 
you're not as good as me. I feel superior to you because I speak the Hebrew language or I speak Aramaic. You speak Greek, which means you are, you're not as Hebrew as I am. Are you guys tracking with me on this? There's two groups of people, right? We have stayed Hebrew, we have adopted Greek culture, and there's a conflict there. So that conflict is what's at the center of the conflict inside the church. There are two groups of people. One feels as if we're not getting the same attention, we're not getting the same love and care as the other. And on that note, it was all a part of Jewish culture to love and care for widows. But we can see here that as the Christian church is growing, the Jewish leaders are like, we're not giving you guys anything anymore, right? You guys figure it out on your own. So the church now is setting up a food ministry to serve the, the widows in their church. And that's where we find the Greek speaking widows are looking around and saying, you guys are treating the Hebrew speaking widows better than us. And that's not fair. So uh, number three, the third observation I want to point out from this very first verse that a church body with many parts and has many parts, any neglect or pain inflicted on a single part will impact the whole. Even if the pain and neglect is unintentional, it needs to be addressed with truth and grace. So the Greek speaking widows are being neglected. They're being treated differently than the Hebrew speaking widows. It is hard to measure what percent of the church each group makes up, but you guys can imagine the dominant most uh, prevalent group are the people that speak Hebrew. So it's a smaller group that speaks Greek, and of that smaller group, it's the widows. So you could even say 5%, maybe this is like three or four or 5% of the church, but that's not the point. The point is to measure not how many people are suffering. It's not, is the majority suffering? And that means it's more important. No, if this body is made up of different parts, if one part is being neglected, if one part is in pain, this matters to the whole. We don't give up a portion just to say, well, you guys are, are, are smaller than the rest of us. We're not going to care for you. Luke, who's the author of this writing, what's really interesting is he doesn't spend time making excuses or casting blame, right? This might all be unintentional. It's not really like he, this issue comes up. He doesn't say, well, this is happening because the disciples are unfair. This isn't happening because of this reason or that reason. Honestly, again, the reason and who to blame is something that maybe we are more accustomed to being our focus, but it's not the focus here. The focus is how can we serve and love every part of the body the, the, the same way, the right way. It doesn't really matter who's to blame. It could be intentional, it could be unintentional. Either way, it must be addressed with truth and grace. It's easy to convince ourselves that we're not guilty for something because we're not actively a part of the problem, but just putting the blame off of ourselves again, is not the point. Our invitation is to be a part of the solution, to be a part of the body and to look after each other. So three things, again, from this very first verse, just to take away, a growing community can never remain in the good old days because new people, which is a good thing, means new opportunities and new ways to serve and love each other. Number two, the bias and the brokenness outside of the church has the potential to creep in and influence. Again, it might be unintentional, but it's always odd when the same people who are marginalized outside of a church, it's a little odd that they're also the people marginalized inside of the church. So it might not be as unintentional uh, as, we might, as we might hope. And number three, that a church is a body with many parts. So any neglect, any pain inflicted on a single part impacts the whole. And again, this is a, our example for a church. It's an example for a community, for a connect group, for a home. You might think maybe the littlest one in my family is upset. Well, they are the littlest. So we're all going to move forward and move on, and they're going to deal with it. Or maybe there's one family in my connect group. There's one family in my extended family. There's one person... We can always measure who's bigger, who's better, who, who's got more skin in the game. That's not the example we see here. We don't put a commodity or a value on people based on how many are there. You know, what do they bring to the table? How good are their skills and resources? We don't see any of that. These are Greek speaking widows, which means they grew up in another part of the world. 
They immigrated to Jerusalem and now live as part of the local church. They probably don't have a lot of family in the area. They don't have a lot of resources to give. They are collecting food because they have nothing. It would be so easy to over, uh, you know, over, uh, sorry, move past or step over this group of people because they don't have a lot to offer. But it's clear by their response that if one part of the body is neglected and in pain, then there needs to be a truthful and grace-filled response. So we're gonna move into the next part of this and kind of wrap it up with three action steps we can see the early church take. So in verse two, the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God, not running a food program. And so brothers select seven men who are well-respected and are full of the spirit and wisdom. We will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked this idea in verse five, and they chose the following. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, who is con- uh, Philip, uh, I'm gonna say Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Permanus, Nicholas of Antioch, earlier converted to the Jewish faith. So here's the names of the people. We'll get back to that, why they included the names. These seven were presented to the apostles who prayed for them and laid their hands on them. In verse seven, so God's message continued to spread. The number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem and many of the Jewish priests were converted too. Now that's amazing. I mean, that's absolutely incredible. I could not even unpack how important that is, but I'll try in a minute. If we wanna highlight three action steps we can take as a community of believers, again, mainly as a church, but also in community, connect groups at home, it's so easy to say, well, my spouse's uh, pain or, or neglect right now, I can put a value on that and measure it and decide whether or not to respond. Nope, it all deserves a response, but how can we respond? Three action steps, number one, A healthy church faithfully discerns what is wrong and compassionately moves to make it right. Okay, so we can can faithfully discern. It invites us to seek out what is true, not what is convenient, not whatever supports my preference or bias. It is crazy to see, you know, churches split over preferences. Like churches literally will will break apart because of maybe um, an instrument on stage. They might break apart because of, uh, you know, the style of music. They might break apart because of the carpet or the color of the paint, or we wanna switch the chairs. And someone says, I can't be a part of this anymore. And I, I can't even laugh at it because it's true. And probably many of us know, um, you know, some friends and some churches that have been a part of those, those kinds of divisions where there's a pain, there's a preference, and what's the difference? To faithfully discern, is this something that's a, a preference? Is this something that just, I don't like, so maybe I need to address it honestly. This is not an issue, this is not a pain, I'm not being neglected, there's just something going on that I don't like. If the communion juice is too sweet or too sour, is that a reason to abandon the community of faith that you belong in, right? If, if the cracker is too wet or too crunchy, I mean, literally, we, we can joke about that, but there's things, if we're not faithfully discerning, what is a real issue? What is a real problem? Is there a real neglect or pain going on? Or am I just maybe being a little too tied to my preferences? On the other side, if there's a real neglect and a real pain, something is going on and there's harm in our community, at home, in our connect groups, in our church, I should be careful not to dismiss it. They say, well, you're just, you're just you know, having a bad attitude or you're just over-dramatizing this. Again, the, the disciples could have, have played the majority card. They could have played the we're too busy card or the do you see all the good we're doing? A few hungry widows isn't that bad, right? There's so many different ways that they could have responded, but they faithfully discerned, is there a hurt and pain here? And once they realized the truth, when they realized that this was real, they compassionately moved to make it right. They compassionately moved, this complaint is coming from Greek speaking believers, which means they must have gone and interacted with Greek speaking people to hear about it. 
Does that make sense? Like this is a complaint from Greek speaking believers. The, the majority of the church leaders are Hebrew speaking. They could have said outside of our immediate circle, right? Our immediate circle are Hebrew speaking people. This is a complaint coming from another group. Well, we're gonna stay inside of our circle to find a solution. I'm gonna stay inside of my kind of echo chamber to, to come up with a way to help and serve these people. I don't think that was the case. I think that the clear indication here is that they must have interacted with, they must have listened to the people who were who bringing the complaints because otherwise they wouldn't have heard it. Right? They wouldn't have, have been made aware of it. It came directly to them and they were willing to listen. To compassionately move to make things right means I'm going to be willing to listen to someone when they say they're hurt at home. If my spouse, if my child, if my, my sister, if my brother is hurt, I can't do much. I can, I can make up my own solution. I could be inside of myself and of myself to provide a measure of care that I think is best, but have I taken the time to listen? Well, what is your hurt and where is it coming from? And then maybe I could better respond with compassion. There are a lot of divisive issues in our country right now. And friends, the truth is all of them require more compassion. All of them require more listening. All of them require more intention to live outside of myself and hear and see another person. Because if I can only hear and see myself, you're only gonna get my best idea. And, and that, that binary thought process of it's either my thought that is right or another thought that is wrong it is a, a cause of division. So when we look again in all these different conversations, if I were to be more compassionate in my response, if I could holistically uh, move to heal and help and serve and love, that will require me to engage people who are different, who engage people who are new. Not to, not to sacrifice the truth, not to sacrifice what I know is right, but to listen, to be a part of a, a conversation, an interaction. Community will be divided if communication is cut off. You have to be willing to listen. And, and then that is so true at home. And, you know, we think about this, like lessons you learn, people you learn from. I've been blessed to learn so much from my family, from my mother and father. And there's been people in our lives as Emily and I were getting married and we talk so much about communication, right? So much about being able to listen and, and hear your, your spouse. Because if I can't hear, if I can't see what they're, what they're hurting with or what they're feeling, I'm not gonna be able to love and support them well. And so people modeled that, people explained that to us. And we did premarital counseling and we got to, to learn from another person to, to kind of put our guards down and like, I'm going into marriage in my, my early 20s. I think I've got it all figured out. No, we're going to invite someone else to speak into our life so that Emily and I can better be prepared to hear and listen to each other. So listening and learning from other people is just a critical step to discern faithfully what is right and what is wrong and compassionately move to love and service. How can we love and serve another person if we're the only ones allowed to decide what and where their needs exist? Second thing, second action step, a dynamic church has an active body with members that accept the call to serve. The mission is shared and celebrated among the followers of Jesus. I think my favorite part about this passage, about this example, about this case study for disarming division, for nurturing unity, is the fact that they called all the believers together. Again, here is the majority body of Hebrew speaking believers, and there's a minority group of Greek speaking widows. It could have just been, okay, one of us will go over, we'll, we'll kind of have a, a powwow with this group of people, um, and we'll all move on. But when they were, were able to faithfully discern that this is an issue for our church, this is going to be a potential source of division. This is a wrong that we need to make right. They invited everybody into the conversation to acknowledge what is happening is not good. We need to do better. They have that as a, a unilateral communication. And then for this group of people, if you remember, when Jesus was walking and teaching and, and doing his ministry on earth, these disciples multiple times asked questions about who gets to be in charge and we're in heaven, Jesus. Which one of us is the greatest? Which one of us is the best? 
Here we are in Acts chapter 6. They are the leaders of the church, and they feel confident to invite the church in to help solve this problem. It's not that, hey, all of you need to listen to the wisdom of these few people. They said, no, how can we together speak into raising the floor to, to making a better community for us all? The mission is shared and celebrated. There's an implied assumption, right, that the church leaders will do everything, right? And guys, sometimes we live in that implied assumption that, that Pastor Drew is both going to every week prepare a sermon, turn the lights on, uh, lead the, the food pantry to teach your connect group, and then also maybe make a house call when you need it. Like one person can't do all of that. It's not what's best. It's not what God is calling every person to do. And as we look at this, a active body with many members who accept the call to serve means that every single one of us have a role to play. We're all called to be a part of this. We're all called to the love and service in the church. The work was not beneath the church leaders. It wasn't wrong for them to do it, except that if they took on this mission, if they were going to be the ones to carry the torch for feeding the Greek-speaking widows, it would have meant them saying no and spending less time doing the thing that God called them to do. So by going to the congregation, I can do what God has called me to do, right? That's what they're telling these people. God has called them to, to lead in teaching and prayer and evangelism. Evangelism. That's what I need to do because God has called me to do it. Someone here is called to serve and love and faithfully care for these hungry widows. So who is it? Let's raise up seven men and they give the qualifications that are, are of their heart, that they are filled with wisdom. They are filled with the spirit. It's not about a hard skill. We're not looking for seven people that have uh, food service backgrounds or administration degrees. It's seven people that have the right heart and the right spirit to serve. And a lot of times you might think, I, can't, I couldn't serve in the coffee shop on Sunday morning because I'm not a barista. All right, I cannot be a part of kids ministry because I don't have an early education degree. I couldn't serve on the worship team because I did not go to be classically trained as a pianist. We can put qualifications and disqualifications on ourselves, but time and time again, God, God gives the qualities to the people he calls. He doesn't just call people that have, have perfect resumes. So they're they're being invited, this church, to find seven people who have the qualifications of a heart that loves and follows Jesus Christ, that is filled with wisdom and filled with the Spirit. So again, I can look at some church examples for you all because when the church is actively serving, the mission is growing and moving faster and further and more effectively. If you put everything on the shoulders of a staff, if they put everything on the shoulders of the apostles, the church would not have been very effective. So in our church right now, I use the cafe as an example, great weekly opportunity to serve. In fact, if there's not enough people to serve, we can't offer a, a nice cafe every Sunday morning. Kids ministry right now is excited about what God is doing and is looking to grow. Do you guys know that? Kids ministry is looking to grow here at Severn Run. We are excited about raising up and training and loving the next generation with the light and love of Jesus Christ. But we have some, some roles to fill. Right? We can't just put children into a room, close the door, and walk away. That would not be excellent kids' ministry. So in order to have more ministry, to have more gospel spreading, to have more love and service to children, there is an opportunity, there is a need in our church for more people to answer the call to serve. And I'll give you two easy examples. Uh, Mark, our kids' ministry director, is looking to start and continue to grow a host team on Sunday morning more people that could be present in the hallway to help greet and welcome new families, to offer additional security, to offer additional resources. So that's not leading a classroom. That's not teaching the lesson. It's not uh, masterfully working a, a hand puppet, uh, you know, or a flannel graph, uh, which I don't think we do anymore, which is a shame. We need to go back. <laughs> We need to go forward. We need more people who will answer the call to serve. And if you're like, well, I'm not great with kids. Okay, host team is not really a kids heavy position. It's a great need in our church that's gonna help us reach more people. And then in our preschool right now, we're really excited. We have three, four and five year olds together, which is really, really cool, except 
I think it would be even better, Mark and I think it would even be better to have a two and three-year-old classroom and then a four and five-year-old classroom. But to have two classrooms, again, I'm not a mathematician, we're gonna need more people to make that a reality, more people to serve, uh, more people to lead, more people to love in those spaces. So just a couple of options, cafe, uh, weekly, every single week, the food distribution. I mean, there's a, you know, hit the nail on the head. We have a food, a food ministry. We have a distribution team. There's always more ways to love and serve. We as a staff cannot be the hands and feet to carry, physically carry the work of all of this. Some of us have bad backs. Some of us are just not uh, omnipresent or all powerful. This is not made for us to do everything. You are made to live out in love and service in Jesus Christ. You are invited, and I hope you feel empowered as we look at this example. There's disunity among the church. There are needs that are not being met. What do they do? They call the people to action. They call the people to respond and to serve. And the elders lay their hands in prayer and they celebrate this because it is good. And a unified church is on a mission. It cannot be defeated. And I love, again, the names of those people. I think it's really special here. The qualifications are, uh, are about their heart and character. But many of the names that were just listed are actually, they're Greek names. So it's very, it's very likely that most of the people they invited to help serve were people that speak Greek. I mean, it just makes sense. I think as a church, sometimes, again, we overcomplicate it. Um, maybe I'm not the right person, this or that. Guys, if there's people in this building, there's always things to do. So there's roles that are just like they're perfect for you. Are you willing to step out and ask, where could I serve? If you go to the website, there's a service form you could fill out and be in contact with us. We'd love to help you discover some opportunities. Maybe it's not kids ministry. Maybe you've had something tugging on your heart for the grounds team or for helping lead and start a connect group. Maybe it's something off campus in a prison ministry or a school ministry. I cannot be the voice of God inside of your heart and mind. I know that that's already there. Are you willing to respond to actively be a part of the church to grow rapidly as the early church did? And the final conclusion here, the final takeaway really is that a united church keeps the main thing as the main thing. Uh, the main thing is the main thing. And we, you know, we got to serve with a pastor in Tennessee who would love to say this all the time. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing, right? Uh, it's very catchy and it works and it's true. The main thing for the disciples was to, to serve in the role that God called them to. You could uh, say, well, I'm so focused on my work, I don't have time to hear about the needs of this small, marginalized group of people. But that was not their heart, not their posture. They were able to faithfully discern what was wrong and then compassionately move to make it right. In order to do that, they invited everyone to walk into their own calling as we all follow Jesus, as we all walk that path. There is roles and ministries for you. There are opportunities and needs that you are equipped to do. God will give you the qualifications of skill and time when God gives you the, the call to ministry. I mean, again, you can look all throughout the Bible when God chose, his, uh, chose Moses to be a public speaker. Um, it doesn't make any sense because he, he wasn't a very good public speaker. We're always shocked and blown away at the things that God calls us to do. But if the main thing is to follow our Lord and leader, Jesus Christ, and to live out his gospel mission, then I'll step into whatever role God puts in front of me because that's the main thing. And when there's people who are hurting and people are, are feeling this, this pain of neglect, it's not about my defensiveness. It's not about making sure that everyone knows it's not my fault and I need to push the blame. No, the main thing is to, is to love in service, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to be like Jesus. The main thing is not to make a political statement. It's not to win an argument. It's not to, to make sure that everyone knows that we're, that we're righteous and good. It's not the main thing. The main thing for these people here, the thing that they could not avoid, they could not, they could not say no to, was to be like Jesus, was to love well, to live Jesus, and to believe big. That's their mission. That's their invitation. That's the main thing. So there's no church politics, there's no ego, there's no culture war. It was just Jesus. And in doing so, God used their ministry to lead even many of the Jewish priests to faith. 
So the people that just had them arrested in the last chapter, the people that just said, you must stop doing this, when they saw them continue, when they saw their faithful testimony, they were moved. They responded to the gospel. I mean, how amazing is that? The people we think are our enemy, the people that are throwing rocks at the church are the people that God is wanting us to invite, the the people that God is ready to lead in response. So if the main thing is to be like Jesus, if the main thing is to live out his mission, then we're not concerned about who's our enemy, who's attacking, who's in front of us, who's behind us. It's just following Jesus. As we close today, our challenge is to follow the example found in Acts chapter six, to faithfully discern what is wrong and compassionately move to make it right. In our community, in our, in our church, in our homes, we share and celebrate the mission of the church by actively serving as part of the body and to keep our faith in Jesus Christ at the center of everything that we do. Guys, we get to watch death turn to life. We get to watch the light turn on in the hearts and minds of children and students and and families. We get to be a part of something that thousands of years ago sparked in this small group of people that all pretty much looked the same and talked the same and thought the same. And then it grew rapidly like wildfire across the nations and across the world. So yes, new things, new people, new times, new, new traditions, new backgrounds. It can be complicated, but it also can be the most beautiful image of heaven that any of us will ever encounter on earth. That every people, every nation, every family bears the image of God. To listen and to learn and discover, to honor that in each other. Again, to watch death come to life as the people that today we think are an enemy, tomorrow walk step in step with us as we follow Jesus. There is hope for that. In a world that is, is, is broken and full of bias, there is hope for unity and peace and love. I mean, it sounds great, right? It sounds beautiful, but we get to sing, we get to celebrate, we get to believe big that our God is good, that his love is for all of us, and that we are all called to follow his son, Jesus Christ. Let's pray, and then we're going to worship. God, thank you for this message. Thank you for the hope of your love. God, thank you for the invitation to be a part of your church. God, each of us has an opportunity. Each of us has a role to play. And I pray that we can all keep the main thing, the main thing. Tomorrow will have its troubles. It'll have its confusion and its questions, God, but you are with us. So as we move forward, help us to not look back. God, we can celebrate the past. We can honor the past and the tradition. God, we can sing a hymn. We could sing a new song too, because you are good. And every day, God, we get discovered new things about who you are and how you love us. So I pray that each person in this room, every person watching online, God, will grow in that confidence to know, grow in the confidence of knowing who you are and what you've done for them, that they can turn their life to you. They could set their eyes on you, no matter how many times we've fallen and failed. God, that you are there waiting for us. God, that you are turning death to life, that we can celebrate and anticipate and be a part of your church. God, it is for all of us. So I pray that we will, in our imperfection, in our sin, God, help us to see each other, to love each other well, to live Jesus and believe big as a church. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
everybody for joining us for worship today. Let's go out this week and love well, live Jesus, and believe big. <laughs> <laughs>